come from Psalm 62 from the New Living Translation Bible. And it says, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. So many enemies against one man, all of them trying to kill me. To them, I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but curse me in their hearts. Yet all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. And the song is, I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. When my cross is heavy, I shall not be moved. The church of God is marching. I shall not be moved. Jesus is my captain. I shall not be moved. I'm fighting sin and Satan. I shall not be moved. Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus the Christ we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you are good and you are God. We thank you, Father God, for another chance to worship you by listening and observing your word. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for you are so good and you have blessed us again. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you. And bless us, Lord, that we will understand your word. We ask you, Father God, that you, your word will become real to us, that your word, Father God, will be something that we can tell others about, that their lives will be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yeah. Oh, Jesus is our he is. I shall not be moved. He is. Jesus is our captain. And I shall not be be moved just like a tree, like a tree by the wall. I shall not be hallelujah to the Lamb. When you plant it, you ought not be moved. Amen. Is that your uh, decoration today? Is that your testimony that, that you're planted by the rivers 
and you're planted by the waters. And because of Jesus, you shall not be moved. Anybody has that testimony tonight? Anybody? Anybody? Don't fool me now. Don't fool me. Whatever you do, don't fool me. Don't fool me because trials are coming. Tribulations are here. Lifestyles are being changed. But you ought to have a conviction. And that conviction ought to be that regardless of what comes along, you will not be moved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 20, 21 and 22 and 23. 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. In the New Testament at the back of your book, and I want to always begin by asking questions about the previous lesson. Amen. Or the previous lessons or the previous lessons, the homework assignment and that kind of carrying on. Somebody tell me the difference between lust of the flesh, lust of the eye and the pride of life. Anybody. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh and the, and the pride of life. Is there a difference? Yes, lust of the eye is something that you know you ain't supposed to have. It. You, you want it anyway. Well, none of them are anything we're supposed to have, right? Not any of them. None of them, right? So let's make sure we understand what lust is. Lust is a strong desire. Brother, brother, brother Miles, you didn't open that door? Oh, it's open. Okay. All right. Lust, lust of the eye, lust of the fresh flesh and the pride of life. What is lust? A strong desire. Is it a godly desire? No. No? We're guessing. It's not, a, it's not a godly desire, right? It's a desire that is generated by the flesh. It is a desire that's generated by the eye. It is a desire that's generated by your pride. It is of the devil. Anything that's not of God is of what? Of the devil, right? So we can call it satanic. Am I right? So some people fall in lust and think they're falling in love. Yes? Anybody? You know anybody like that? They fall in lust and they thought they were falling in love. Isn't that something? They thought they were falling in love. What happens when you fall in lust instead of in love? Come on, some of y'all that's experienced veterans at this. Okay, tell me about other folk then. Don't tell me about you. Say, so what's this Brown? Tell me about somebody else. It doesn't last. When you fall in lust, it doesn't last. It doesn't last. Well, you know, I know some folk that have been fighting for 50 years and they're still married. <laughs> they, 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 they learn to fight as a way of life. Are they in love or are they in lust? It lasted. Well, I think it, think that they will be in love. Reverend, Reverend, Reverend Carl David Evans tells this story. Everybody, everybody that was listening, he tells this story. He talks, he talks about the fact that they went to a lady's house <clears throat> and while they were there, they had to wait f for the homeowner to get there. In the meantime, the homeowner's mother and the homeowner's aunt welcomed them in and they began to talk. So the aunt said, hey, you married? And his brother says, yes, I'm married. I, I, I was married, is what he said. No, I'm not married. I was married. She said, well, how are you going to be a preacher and you're not married? And you got a divorce. How are you going to be a preacher? He said, well, I was married, but it just didn't work out. She said, well, I was married for 50 years. And she said, it was full of hell. <laughs> she said she told the, told the undertaker to, when you bury him, bury him way underground and turn him upside down so he won't crawl back up this way. <laughs> True story. So. So let me ask you this. Were they in love or are they in lust? They, it lasted 50 years. So it's Brown, it lasted 50 years. It was a testimony, but it wasn't a good testimony. She said, I was married 50 years and it was full of hell. But she was criticizing this young preacher because he had gotten a divorce and because he wasn't going to live like she lived. How you call yourself a preacher? And you can't keep no marriage. 
He said, well, ma'am, are you married? No, I was married. I was married for 50 years. And she said, it was full of hell. So my question, was it love or was it lust? Mm. She lust the love or love the lust. So let us understand clearly, lust is not of God. Lust is, is of the devil. Lust is a strong, sensual desire. It's a desire that you have for something or somebody that you don't need. That's not of God. Are you with me? So we have lust of the flesh. Let's talk about lust of the flesh. Give me an example of lust of the flesh and tell me what lust of the flesh is. We've been talking about this for two weeks, right? So lust of the flesh. Anybody, anybody. Lust of the flesh. The word flesh means carnal, right? The word flesh means that that is what you can see and it's temporal. Lust of the flesh. Somebody talk to me. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. Lust is a strong. Ungodly desire. So what is the lust of the flesh? It's a strong, des ungodly desire of the flesh. Because the next thing I'm going to ask you is, what's, what's lust of the eye? Or give me some examples. And we'll, we'll figure out what the definition is. Lust of the flesh. I'm on lust of the flesh. Something that satisfies just your physical. Okay, it satisfies the physical. You, you, you have this desire for your physical to satisfy. One person said, well, I just can't. Say, say again. Gluttony, gluttony. It satisfies you physically, but it is sin. But we're like, you got to stop eating that stuff like that. I mean, when you, but we like say, if he didn't have to eat, he wouldn't eat. But guess what? Since he has to eat every time he gets a chance. Full course meal. So look at this. Gluttony. The devil even tried it on Jesus. He approached him with lust of the flesh, lust of the eye and the pride of life. He says, Jesus, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days, he said, Jesus, look at here. If you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you be the son of God. See, the question was not if he was son of God. The question was, can he get him to to give into his flesh. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter three and Matthew chapter four, the Bible says that he has he has spent 40 days without eating. And y'all was troubling me about 21 days when you still eat. I mean, you were eating. You just weren't eating what you used to eat. And check this out. Some of the time. When you're fasting, you usually wouldn't even be bothered by not eating these things. But since you're in the midst of the fast, you get to a point in your life where you say, man, I sure do wish I had some pork. I sure wish I had some candy. But you can go a whole month without any of it. But the moment you start fasting, the lust of the flesh kicks in. I mean, guess what? I know and you haven't told me. Everything that you were fasting from became an advertisement on the TV. Everything. I mean, everything, everything you desired, everything that made you feel good, the body feel good. The devil knows how to bring it to you, doesn't he? Lust of the flesh. Come on, tell me about lust of the eye. An example of lust of the eye. What you see, you want something somebody else has. I see them with it, so I want it. A lot of folk in financial debt because they saw it. I mean, they just they cry, they they file bankruptcy and get other folk to pay their stuff off and they still trying to scratch out the hole. And guess what? What you see so time sometimes is so heavy on you. When you get out the hole, you dig back into the hole. Isn't that something? I said to one lady and they gave me permission to share. I said to one lady, you are not to buy another pair of shoes. For the next six months. 
Her husband said, I can't stop her from buying shoes. I mean, she has shoes everywhere. I have no closet space because she has shoes. I said, well, sister, how many times a month you buy shoes? About five times. I said, brand new shoes, brand new shoes. I said, well, are you giving the old ones away? No, I got, I got a, a stack of them. So she had this shoe fetish. So she had lust of the eye. Everything, every shoe that got in her pathway. Black bottoms, blue bottoms, green bottoms, red bottoms, every shoe she could find. It didn't matter. If it looked good, she wanted it. Give me another example of lust of the eye. Lust of the eye. Well, y'all shoe sure are quiet. Now, now, if we were on the streets, y'all would be throwing this stuff out here. Yes, sir. Someone else's wealth. Someone else's wealth. Someone else's wealth. Lust of the eye. What you see is what you want. Sister Whitlock about to say something. Sister Whitlock, I want you to say something. <laughs> Lust of the eye. Lust of the eye. What you see. What you see. I just got to, I mean, I'm just so in lust with it. Now, no one in this room has mentioned it yet. Give me another example, Lust of the eye. Come on, be real with me. She gove. There she gove. Did you hear what Sister Brown said? Sister Brown said a good looking man. She said when she saw that tall, dark and handsome guy, she just couldn't resist. That's what she said. A good looking man. And then he had that Louisiana a tongue, too. I mean, he, he, he spoke. I mean, she just couldn't resist. Are you with me? So somebody else give me an example. Men, you got to step up now. Step up. Brother Whitlock, what you got? Tell me something about lust of the eye. Well, that goes back to, to food. You can put too much on the plate. You can put too much on the plate. You can put too much on the plate. And most of us grew up in homes that said, what you put on your plate, you're going to eat it. You're going to eat it, right? Your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Okay. At least I got some people that know that one. <laughs> your eyes are bigger than your stomach. That means you just see it and you want it. I got to have it. The pride of life. Give me an example of pride of life. Hmm? Greed. 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 So how, how can greed get me in trouble? With pride. How can that get me in trouble with pride? Thinking you more than everybody. And Thinking you more than, more than other people, right? You know, Christians really suffer with this one. The pride of life, even on a spiritual level. Christians get to the point where they think they just, just stepped out the cloud. They look down on people and they classify their sin. And then they come to the con con conclusion that that y'all have sinned. When the Bible said all have sinned. So we're so it was such a pride. Now is is LSU. Roll Tide. Southern. TSU is that kind of pride. Is that the pride of life? Is that what we're talking about? Is that the pride of life? If it consumes you. So so in the in the last championship game, if we had walked in on Sunday and Sister Whitlock had Brother Miles in the in the in the headlock, <laughs> it had consumed her. <laughs> she she jumped up and grabbed him and pulled him to the floor. I knew we should have beat you all. It has consumed her. <laughs> It, it, it has, they have been consumed. So is pride ever healthy? Is pride ever, ever healthy? Is there a healthy sense of pride? Yeah. All you gotta do is ask grandparents. I mean, they, they'll tell you in a heartbeat. When is pride healthy? When it encourages someone to achieve something good. I'm proud of you, I stand up, I clap for you. You know, I just turn cartwheel for these children. I mean, I just act a fool for the children of New Beginning Church. Is that a problem? 
They they bring in good grades. I'm turning flips. We have to have pride as a sense of encouragement, right? We we have to have pride. When when I when when we took some people to my hometown, we had to ride by the mighty Gentry High School Rams Stadium and School. We had to ride by that. Was that a problem? <laughs> We're proud of our mosquitoes. I mean, we grow mosquitoes like no one. So we have to understand that only when it conflicts with what God does, only when it conflicts with what God is doing in our lives, is it unhealthy. And if it's healthy, then it's not lust. We ought to have a love for each other. Love. Then he talks about the deception of the last hour. The deception of the last hour. He talked. We 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 talked about loving for don't have love for the world, but have love for God. And then he talks about the fact that the Antichrist, the Antichrist is coming. And then he says the Antichrist, for, for lack of understanding, let me say it this way. The Antichrist is the Antichrist. More than one Christ, the Antichrist are already here. The Antichrist is coming. But the Antichrist are here or the crisis. Let me say it that way. Are here. And they are here because they are deceiving the world with heresy. What is heresy? Heresy. What is heresy? Heresy, heresy, false doctrine, false, false uh, prophecy, heresy, false doctrine. Right. If you really look at that word real closely, heresy. Is hearsay. Is not the word of God. Heresy. Hearsay. Is not the word of God. Therefore, it becomes extra biblical. What is extra biblical? Outside of, Outside of scripture. That means if I add something to the scripture, it's extra biblical. If I take some from the scripture, it is extra biblical. Are you with me? So what we have to understand, ten dollar sister, what we have to understand, what we have to understand is that Heresy is already here. False doctrine is already here. False prophets are already here. And many times false prophets line their pockets, line their pockets. Fifteen dollars. Many times, many times false prophets line their pockets with money. Please don't go to another Coliseum to be blown upon. Please don't get in another line to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. Being anointed. So he says that the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist, more than one, are already here. And we know we're in the last hour because the Antichrist are duking people. They're persuading people to walk away from God. And then he says that they who were among us are no longer walking with us. Now, is he talking about the folk that used to be a new beginning church going to hell because they're no longer here? No. Why? 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 Why you say that? Because it doesn't mean that if they're here, uh, that's the only way they can get to heaven. OK, so it's the Bible says the Bible says that they have walked away from us. What is he talking about? Is he talking about walking away from New Beginning Church? And he says that if they had been with us, they would not have left us. So what is he saying? Walking away from the faith. The thing to remember here is that is that during this period. Christianity was new on the scene. And people were straddling the fence as they are today. And as people straddle the fence, their buddies convinced them to go another way. So he's saying 
that those who have been straddling the fence, who have now gone another way, they were never one of us. They were never with us. They just walked away. Are you with me? It ought to be it ought to ring true to you in the fact that once you're saved, you are saved to the day of reckoning. You are saved until Jesus gets back. Now, the question is that some folk ask the question, are you really saved? <laughs> Do you know some people that you look at them sometime, even though they're in church and you be like, is he or she really saved? Has 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 they have they really have they really been born again? Has he really been born again? Is he really saved? Because we have to get to a point to know that only God knows. Right. One preacher preached for 35 years in his last sermon. He got saved. So we can't tell. Right. I mean, he preached the un, unadulterated word of God. For 35 years. And in his retirement, he got saved. What does that say? We can always put on shows. We can always put on airs. And check this out. Some people are such great showmen. Until you really can't tell. I mean, they can, they can, they can, they can do it. They can. And, and some people are doing things as theatrics. I mean, they just, they just putting on a performance, performance. I mean, some of them ought to get a, a LeBron James ought to have an Oscar. I mean, he, he ought, he ought, he ought, I mean, he's the biggest crowd baby, but he says he's the, he's the greatest player on the planet. So there are people in church who play those roles. And check this out, the referee agrees with them. Check this out. Some people who are playing these roles, the pastor agrees with them. But God ain't fooled. God is not fooled. God understands where we are. He knows what we're doing. So he says the Antichrist is here and the Antichrists are here and the Antichrist is coming. Let's look at verses 20 through 23. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. New King James here. But you have an anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. He's telling these newborn Christians. That because you stay with the faith. The Holy Spirit is within you. The Holy Spirit has made a difference in your life. And therefore, this Holy One, the Holy Spirit, pneumos in the Greek, meaning God breathed, God's air. The Holy Spirit, he has made a difference in your life. This word anointing, you know, we throw that word around these days, right? But this word anointing means that that we have been unctioned. God has set us aside. It comes from the same word that we get the word charisma. It means to be endowed. You have been endowed with the Holy Spirit. You've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. You have been so endowed by the Holy Spirit until you are different. In your spare time, look at the name in the Old Testament called Caleb. What do we know about Caleb? The name Caleb with the C. Caleb. What do we know about Caleb? He was he was one of the 12 that went over to spy out the land to observe. What else do we know about Caleb? What do we know about Caleb? Tell me something about Caleb. One thing that we overlook sometimes, we know that Caleb and Joshua were the two that came back with a good report, right? We know that Caleb and Joshua made it over into the promised land, right? But one thing that the Bible says about Caleb that we overlook many times is it says that Caleb had a different spirit. When the church folk were raising hell, Caleb didn't raise hell. It says Caleb had a different spirit. 
Caleb had the anointing upon him. Caleb had been anointed by God. Do you have a different spirit or you just join in with the rest of them? When it's the day of attack, do you you claw, claw into when it's a day to upset the vision? You, you, you become a part of it, too. Even on your job, if one person say that they should have made that, they should not have made that decision. Do you join it? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> or do you try to reconcile it? Now, another thing we know about Caleb, the Bible says that Caleb calmed the people. Caleb shut down the mess. When I when I teach and train deacons, I say to them that you are firefighters. The Bible says in Acts chapter seven that they chose seven men full of the Holy Spirit, seven men with good report, seven men who would would carry out God's business. So the preachers, the apostles would have to leave the word. But these seven men would handle the dispute. The problem with some deacons in the 20th and the 21st century, they start to dispute. And I remind these deacons, you are firefighters. You're not an arson. You're a firefighter. I mean, you got some deacons just that light the fire. And then the people join in with them and say, y'all letting that pastor get out of control. Let me share something with you. Deacons were not selected to control the church or control the pastor. Deacons were selected to serve. Diacone. Service. They were selected to serve the church, serve the pastor, serve by way of the Holy Spirit. That's why I said find seven men full of the Holy Spirit. That we can place over this business. What business was it? There was a fight going on. What was the fight? The women were the, the Hellenistic women were being being discriminated against in in the serving and the rationing of food. The Grecian women, the Hellenistic women, they were being being they were being dis disproportional and marginalized is, is what we call it now. They've been they've been marginalized. They they've been discriminated against. So they made deacons deacons so they can handle this business because they were unction. It says they were anointed. They were unction by the Holy Spirit. They were endowed by the Holy Spirit to handle this business. Are you with me? They, they had to handle this business. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, the Holy Spirit himself, and you know all things. Now look at the Bible. Listen, listen at the Bible now. If, if you, didn't, you didn't know any better, you would think that the Bible is saying that these Christians know everything. It's right there in the text, right? It says, you know everything. Now, I want you to stand to your feet if you know everything. Look at what it says. Can you read it for me, please? I'm reading New King James. Someone read, someone stand there and read verse, verse, verse 20 for me. Second, uh, chapter 2 of first. First John, chap first John, chapter two, stand and read that for me real big, real loud. Any version. 24. Verse 20. Verse 20. Yes, ma'am. Come on. Any, any, come on. Come on. I have a King James. Think, okay. King James. It says, but you, but ye have an unction from the Holy One and ye know all things. Okay. So it says in the King James, you know all things. It says in the new King James, you know all things. That word anointing, she just confirmed that in the new in the in the King James Version, it is an unction, right? It's an endowment. So what is he talking about? You know all things. Brother, Brother Whitlock thinking, he's thinking now, he's thinking. Look at the Bible. This is the word of God, right? Would God say you know, know it all? He says. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you know all things. When we read the Bible, we have to read it in content and context. Sister Brown. Okay, through the Holy Spirit, you will know. 
Okay, through the Holy Spirit, you will know how many things, though? All things? So if we know all things by way of the Holy Spirit, can that be us? Let's think about this. We're reading in content, right? Meaning that we're reading the word of God as it flows through, as the table of content. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. Your yeah, connection to the Holy Spirit. Our focus right now is on all things. And he says, you know, all things. Right. And if you know all things, can that be true? Can you know all things? If we knew all things, would we be in the trouble we're in now? We're in trouble right now. I want to tell you, I want to serve notice on you. On my way to the rapture, I want to let you know that if we knew all things, we wouldn't go down that road. We're in trouble. <laughs> How many of y'all agree we're in trouble? We're in trouble. We're in trouble. And we do not have to be Ukrainians to be in trouble. We're in trouble. The great United States of America is in big time trouble. And we just can't blame the president. We're in trouble. It's a spiritual warfare. Let me let me let me just just let you know. When we read in content, meaning we reading the flow of the words previously to it and the words after it. Right. So we read in content. We got to keep reading in while it's in its content. And we also reading in context, meaning the surrounding things and what's going on around them in this particular pericope. Right. So when he says, you know, all things, remember what he talked about. He talked about how you are anointed by way of the Holy Spirit. He talked about the Antichrist that are here in the Antichrist that is coming. He talked about lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. He's saying that the Holy Spirit reveals to you the truth concerning these false prophets. It's not that you know everything. It's the fact that you know all things. You already know things that are pertaining to what he's talking about in the context. What he's talking about in the context text and the content. Are you with me? So we already understand. I mean, we don't have to be sanctified to know no one knows all things but God, right? Jesus doesn't even know when he's showing back up. So that tells me that Jesus doesn't know all things as the son of God. He doesn't know all things. Because Jesus says he doesn't even know when he's coming back. He says only the father knows. So we must conclude that only God, the father knows all things. But for some reason, John pins these words and he says, you know, all things. So what he's talking about is what I'm listing in this content. You, you, you know, the Antichrist, you know how to to walk away from them. You know how how it conflicts with the word of God. And when he talks about those who walked away from us was not of us. You're right. He's not talking about walking away from a particular church or a particular setting or a particular assembly of people. He's talking more about those who have come into the faith. Remember, now, these people are walking away from Judaism. They're walking away from Satanism. And he's saying to us that if they had really, truly walked away from Satanism, they wouldn't have gone back. He's saying to us, because they had the audacity, the nerve, the ability, the gall to walk away, they were never with us. So now he says, you know the story. So he, he says here in this particular pericope, you know, all things, meaning that, you know, the rest of the story. How many people are old enough to remember Paul Harvey? Two, three. Uh uh, maybe four. I knew two people didn't know. Three people don't know, huh? Paul, what was Paul Harvey's sign off? Now you know the rest of the story. Well, somebody tell them what Paul Harvey, who Paul Harvey was, or what what he meant, and wh why he would sign off like that. He was a commentator. He was a commentator. He would reveal things. Yeah, he would reveal facts that that people have been in the dark with. And when he finishes his commentator, he would say, and that is or now, you know, 
the rest of the story. So he would reveal things that people don't, didn't know or people were confused about. Kind of like right now, you have the Russian president telling the people in Russia that Ukrainians are attacking them. But that's why Arnold Schwarzenegger went, Arnold Schwarzenegger went, went live and he said, this is not the truth because they respect him, right? He says, now you know the rest of the story. So what John says to us tonight is, you know, the rest of the story, you know, the whole story. In other words, you know that you are anointed of God. So don't even be tripping. That's what he's saying. Don't even think of it. Dad would say, don't don't even dream of it, baby. Don't 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 even think of it. <laughs> and when he said that it's over. You know, I sus people always ask me, are you ex-military? I said I wanted to be. I mean, I could see myself with that little pointed TP cap on coming home. I could see myself walking straight in the line. I could see myself being able to do things for my country that many could not do. I had visualized it. I had enrolled in the delayed entry program. But daddy said, this is the rest of the story. <laughs> what does that mean, Sister Whitlock? He going he's writing my story. <laughs> that same recruiter that I had signed up with at two o'clock that day. The next day I had to call him before noon and say, I'm out. <laughs> but what John says is now, you know, the rest of the story. Verse, verse verse 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. But because you know it. And that no lie. Is of the truth. He's not writing them because they don't know the truth. Remember, he just said, you know, all things. You already know the truth when it comes to doctrine. You already know the truth when it comes to the apostle creed. You already know the truth when it comes to salvation. You already know the truth that once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, don't even be tripping now. What he's saying is. I have not written you so you will know the truth. You already know the truth. I have not written you, written to you because you do not know the truth. The truth of the matter is there are people in our local churches that have been trained and taught the word of God for many years. And then they get with other folk and act like they don't know anything about God. They give in to lust of the eye, lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Oftentimes tell the story how we used to have quarterly meetings with a group of engineers. We would have quarterly meetings and and in some kind of way, the quarterly meeting would end up at a club or end up at a at a, at a pool joint or something. Right. And then they would come to me and ask, are you all right with this? I say, hey, yeah, I'm fine because I know what I'm going to do when I get there. Right. See, the fact of the matter is the the. They won't give us a raise, but they'll buy you all the drink you can get. All the drink you can drop down They buy and you can get to go drinks. So after shooting pool for the last three hours, so, OK, I'm going to go. I'm going to see if I can drive home now. And, and my, my manager said, yeah, that, that cranberry juice probably really, really got you really a bu uh, buzz. What happened is our children get peer pressured until they do things that they normally wouldn't do because the pressure is on them. And we have grown people that will not bow their head and pray because other folk are listening and other folk are looking. Pure pressure. Peer pressure and pure pressure. So we have to understand that John says. You already know the truth. I'm not writing you because I'm trying to inform you. I'm just trying to inspire you. He's trying to encourage them to keep going. To stay focused. Don't even get in an entanglement. Stay focused. Because we can get in an entanglement and it will cost us our very lives. He's saying whatever you do. 
Stay focused. He's not calling them to inform them. He's writing them and calling upon them to inspire them, to encourage them, to make sure they are fulfilled and know that you're fulfilled in Christ Jesus. We've, we've sold some women to lie that you're not complete without a man. The Bible says we are complete in him. So we can say that Apostle Paul was not complete. But Paul says, if it really, 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 if you really want to know the truth, you can serve the Lord better by being single. But I'm so glad I didn't get the gift. <laughs> I'm so glad that that's not a gift that I have. Paul says that there were some made eunuch and there are some were born eunuchs. The, and the ones who were born eunuchs don't, don't even have a desire to be around a woman in a sensual way. Let me share with you. He says we already know the truth. And guess what? When we do things that's out of order, guess what? We already know what we're doing. Our attitudes, how we carry ourselves. We just need somebody to hold us accountable, right? So he holds them accountable. He says, because you do not know, he says, I'm not writing you because you do not know the truth, but because you already know it. And that no lie is of the truth. What is he talking about here? He's saying, don't even, don't even entertain a little fraction of a lie. You know what the devil does? He gives us part truths. That's what he did to Jesus in his temptation. He says, go on and jump. Go on, jump. God will give his angels charge over you. He was quoting scripture to God himself. He was quoting scripture to Jesus. He gives him enough of the scripture. Where a normal everyday person would sin. Give him just a bit, just a bit. He said, John says, no lie is of the truth. No lie have any impact on the truth. And the truth is not impacted by the lie. The two can't walk down the same street together. You already know the truth. Haven't you told your children? You know better than that. You know better than that. And then you did it anyway. You knew when you were doing it, it was wrong. And you do it anyway. What John says to us is we must do better because we know better. We got to do better. When we make a bonehead decision, we knew better before we made the decision. People have walked off their job because of their pride. They've cussed their bosses out because of their pride. And usually now, if you cuss your boss out, you just keep on walking. <laughs> Are you with me? Unless you Ted Sam Hare. I had an uncle named Sam Hare, my daddy's younger brother. He, he, uh, he was a great welder and he worked for Mr. Red Bell. And, and, and he, he, was a, he was a weekend drinker. He started drinking at five o'clock when he, well, when he gets home, he drives home. When he gets home at six o'clock, he comes with a sealed bottle. He started drinking Friday. He drinks Friday, all day Friday and Saturday at two o'clock in the morning, he's knocking on people's doors and, and people know him by the, knew him by then, so they give him a ride. He, he did not drive anything on weekend. People took him everywhere he wanted to go. So the doctor told Uncle, Uncle Ted, as we call him, Sam Hare, told him, look, you need to stop drinking because you're going to die. He said, I'm going to change doctors, too. So he changed doctors. So one, one day, and so when, when, when Uncle Ted would drink, what he would do, he would spend all day Sunday while we're in church sobering up and watching games. So Monday morning, he goes back. But one particular, well, several times, he forgot that it was Sunday, I guess. He showed up at the workplace drunk. So the supervisor fired him. And the owner called him and said, you get on back to work. Supervisor fired him again. 
About three months later, super, the owner called and said, no, we can't get rid of him. Supervisor fired him a third time. The owner called him and said, now look, you go on, sleep it off, but you show back up in the morning. Because he was such a great welder, right? Let me just share this with you. If you know what's right, just do what's right. And don't believe the lie. <laughs> the lie would tell you, oh, you can do it and get by. And you see all of these other folk doing the same thing and they get caught. What make you think you're not going to get caught? <laughs> and for God's sake, stay away from these terms. Just one last time. One, get, stay away from one last time. One last time is your worst enemy. Because God has picked you up and given you a second chance and, and he's blessed. You. Well, not a second chance. He's given you a mother, another, another, another and another chance. And guess what? You're going to tell God, God, let me show you how much I appreciate it. I'm going to get one last time. In. You lack appreciation, right? So he says, you already know that a lie cannot even stand in the midst of the truth. Verse 22. Who is a liar? But he who denies Jesus is the Christ. Who's a liar? Is it he who denies Jesus as the Christ? In other words, if you deny Jesus Christ as the Christ, because a lot of people name Jesus, right? Some people name is Jesus. But when it's Jesus, the Christ, he's the anointed one. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He says, if you deny Jesus Christ. Then he is a liar. Not only do you, he says, do you that you deny that deny Jesus Christ, you must deny him as the Christ. When men say to you, oh, he was a good prophet. No, brother, he wasn't just a prophet. <laughs> he was Jesus Christ. Don't deny him. Oh, he was a good man. Oh, man, you got Muhammad doesn't compare to him. Buddha doesn't compare to him. Aristotle doesn't compare to him. Confucius doesn't compare to him. He is Jesus, the Christ. I got challenged one day. A preacher asked me, he said, man, why do you call him Jesus the Christ? Why you just don't say? She, he said people understand that he's Jesus Christ and you walk around him calling him Jesus the Christ. Because there is nothing and no one like him. There's no other Messiah. There's no other leader. There's no other prophet. He is Jesus the Christ. This word Christ means Messiah. This word Christ means the anointed one. There's nobody like him. While all these men talking about they're anointed, they may be anointed, but he's the anointed one. And we just found out that the anointing by a man is just an unction to do what's right <laughs> and to understand what's right. So Jesus Christ is the anointed one. Therefore, he is Jesus the Christ. And he says, those who don't acknowledge him as the Christ, they are liars. Look at what he says about this liar. He is the Antichrist who denies the father in the son. He says the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrists are already here. And when the Antichrist shows up, Guess what he's going to do? He is going to deny the father in the son. He is Antichrist. What do we say Antichrist was? That which opposed Christ. That who opposes Jesus Christ. He who is in opposition to Jesus Christ. And men will speak their opposition. But guess what? He's still the Christ. And he ties the two together. He says, if they deny the father and they deny the son, they are the Antichrist. And he says, 
that the Antichrist denies the Father and the Son. Let's look further. Verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. You can't have God without having Jesus. You can't have Jesus without having God. Remember I said to you, don't get in another prayer line to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because when the son comes in, the father comes in and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Question or comment? The Holy Spirit, he is present in us. The Holy Spirit resides, he lives, he dwells in us. The Holy Spirit, you see the Trinity all over this pericope. He says the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy One anoints us. And this word anoint means to unction us. Is God unctioning you to do some things that you're not doing? In this context, he's saying that God unctions us to understanding of who Jesus is, who God the Father is, and the recognition of God the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 23, if you are whoever denies the son does not have the father either. He's, he's more than a prophet. He, he's more than just another man. We wouldn't be singing to him if he was just a man. We, we got in this day and time, we have the church of Beyonce. John says, you know better. I mean, we have we have the church, a spirit, a spiritual. Yeah, it's a some spirit is there. It has a spiritual church of Beyonce. Where they sing Beyonce's music. Where they see Beyonce as the leading figure. It's the church of Beyonce. Judgment is coming. Jesus, the Christ, is the one that we worship. He's the one that we honor. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have the Father. If we don't have Jesus, the truth is not in us. The old folk would say, you just a lying wonder. And the truth ain't in you. Let me tell you, the senior saints didn't have a third grade education, but they had the Holy Spirit. That's why they can say, if I don't wake up in the morning, everything will be all right. Because the fact of the matter is, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have the father. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. You can't have Jesus without God. You can't have God without Jesus. You can't have the spirit without them. They are three in one. Questions or comments? You got to have Jesus. You got to have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not a it. The Holy Spirit, he. He's intelligent. He's the third person of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is present in you. It, it's not heartburn when you go to do something wrong. It's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Saying, don't go that way. Don't do that. Don't say that. And you talking about telling somebody a piece of your mind, the Holy Spirit jumping and, and leaping and saying, don't do it. Alarms going off, bells going off, lights going off, neon silent lights and, and with sounds and, and sirens on it going off in you. And you just got to get, I, I feel better if I get this off my chest. It'll just make me feel better. Just make, just, just make, we still talking two weeks later about a man that felt, thought it was going to make him feel better. All of history being made in one night was blown with one act. We talk more about the act than we do about the success story. The devil is waiting on the right opportunity. As Jesus said to Peter, the devil want to have you. Matter of fact, the devil has asked for you. 
And the devil wants to sift you like sifting wheat. He want to sift you like sifting wheat. But the good news about it, Jesus says, I pray for you. You don't even have to acknowledge him. I pray for you. The Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption. You ought to have some questions, questions or comments. Are you anointed? Are you sealed? <laughs> when I think about uh, not as, as a, the exact way, I mean the exact application name, but I think of Job. I always uh, how uh, it was in the movie I saw, and he told uh, Jesus that he was going to take uh, that he was going to destroy his people, and he said that's why he couldn't touch the Job alone, but Job suffered so much and lost so much, yet he didn't give in, he just because he knew, and it took the, uh, in the movie and I have read uh, it took the sun that really caused everything to stay by him uh, you understand what I'm saying, Pastor? I don't understand what you're saying Okay, well then, I just want to say that yeah, when you said be abiding, obedient, mm -hmm. uh, if you follow that story, look at that story. Despite all he lost, he didn't give in to the devil. Okay, right. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. So, so we have to understand that the this, the spirit of God is present with us. He's not just with us; he's in us. And because he's in us, guess what happens? He alerts us. We've been anointed by him. We've been unctioned by him. He, he's 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 on our team. He's on our side. Mm -hmm. Don't don't push him away. He he's there for your good and not your bad. Mm -hmm. You you can you can tell the pastor off. You can tell your coworkers off. But the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit is ringing your bell the whole time. <laughs> Said, so don't do it. Hold it. Don't say it. Don't act that way. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is is telling you. Don't get in that relationship. Matter of fact, leave it. The Holy Spirit is unctioning you. He's still telling you over and over again. And then he's telling some of us, get involved in that relationship. And we're saying, just like Pharaoh, one more night with the frogs. Just want one more night. I can tell you some of these women in here would not have the mind of Pharaoh. One more night with the frogs? Get these frogs out of here. So Jesus paid it all for us on a skull hill called Calvary. He made sure that the Holy Spirit was pre present for us. He made sure that God the Father was present for us. He made sure that God the Son was present. He died on Calvary and rose early that Sunday morning. He did it for you. Don't let Jesus' death be in vain, Sister Davis. Don't let Jesus' death, he said, he's telling Sister Davis, don't let Jesus' death be in vain. They must be having problems. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't let Jesus' death be in vain. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus. If you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're in between church homes or don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Of course, Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Let us know if you want to join the New Beginning Church and we'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your word. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us with your word. We praise you, Father God, for being good and being God. 
Bless us as we come to give to you finances, money. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us to have the increase in order to give to you. Bless us, Father God, to always acknowledge the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Bless us to be obedient unto him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. For those of you who want to give by electronic means, you can do so by giving to our Zelle account. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your offering, your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please come and join us again. Those of you who are sitting, you can come and give your offering and you can come as we as we end out this night. Just now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Yeah. As he shall not be moved, he's like a tree. Yeah. The water. Be. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, I shall not be moved. Yeah, it's like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you, Father God, for this Bible study. We ask you to bless us that we would tell men, women, boys, and girls about the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for every gift. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. Let us stand, please. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. You are dismissed.